This is the story of a beautiful place known as the happiest place on earth. And all of its history, its secrets, and its tricks that you may find if your mind believes in design. And you allow your heart to believe in magic. Step inside and become a citizen of Disneyland. Greetings, fellow citizens of Disneyland. Welcome back to episode 76 of Disneyland for Designers podcast. I'm your host, Mark Bricky. This is my good friend, Tony Mendez, who will be joining me today. Tony, how are you, sir? Very good. How about yourself, Mark? I'm fantastic. Uh, after last week's reception of, hey, this is something that we don't want to talk about, what we should talk about, talking about kind of how the Disney community turned on Bob Chapik. And by the way, thank you guys so much for watching that video making one of the most successful podcasts over here on the youtube channel as well as the podcast platform so many amazing well thought out comments a handful of uh totally crazy ones too but it wouldn't be youtube if there wasn't a couple of lunatics in the crowd but no seriously thank you guys so much for that which kind of made me think you know this is an interesting week we just wrapped up halloween on saturday officially Christmas doesn't start at the Disneyland Resort until next Thursday. A lot of us bought tickets for Marius Nights and, and the reservations are all booked. So there's obviously a lot of people that are interested in partaking in the holiday season at Disneyland, which has traditionally always been the most busiest time of the year, as well as the most magical time of the year. So in this quiet space, I, I thought for the week over on the channel, it'd be interesting to do some things kind of looking at, ironically, we're at the six month reopening of Disneyland. So I thought it would be interesting to sort of do a little bit of an audit on how that reopening went because for sure, Disney and their leadership found themselves in unprecedented times. And therefore the reopening in some spots was a little bit sloppy and that's not a bad thing. It would be hard to do perfection when you're coming out of the most unexpected moment uh, in many of our lifetimes, especially professionally when you look at this time. So what I thought we would do today is look at some mistakes that were made with the magic key. Once again, not a conversation I want to have, but if I'm reading the room and I'm looking at all of our members over in Club 1313 and I'm talking to guests that I'm meeting out at the park and when I'm listening to my friends talk, this is definitely something that's on the minds of a lot of citizens of Disneyland. So it kind of feels like this is a conversation we should get into. And I, I, I want to tell everybody at home, this is a, a complex conversation. I thought about doing this as a news video. I looked at the timeline. I'm like, this is a podcast. This is an hour long conversation. I need Tony to help me with it. But if you go on this journey with me, because first we have to establish the timeline, right? We have to go back and sort of look at all the different marks on the calendar of the reopening of Disney and how they have sold tickets and what those ticket sales look like. But if you go on this journey with me, this is where we're going to end up. There are a couple of suspicious things that are a little bit of a red flag to me. And I kind of feel like this is what a lot of people are thinking, but nobody's really talking about the magic keys get halted on the same day that the ticket prices go up. We're talking about the dream key. We're talking about the big boy. We're talking about the one that obviously they sold too many of. So it's, I'm going to get you guys to my theory on why that happened as well as prices for the park went up exactly, exactly, you know, days from six months of the reopening of Disneyland. And so the magic keys were also pause the top tier ticket was paused exactly two months after it went on sale. So one would almost say that some of these ideas were, well, we'll open up Disneyland. We'll sell tickets at 2019 prices for six months. We'll put out an annual pass and we'll sell it at a 2019 entry level price for two months. Right when we're getting ready to start our busiest time of the year, like, a lot of it, Tony, to me, feels like it was boardroomed out, pre-scripted, and I want to break down how we got there today. Does that make sense? Yeah, and uh, kudos for turning this into Disneyland for designers, true crime, the death of the annual pass, <laughs> a timeline, because that's really what it is. What we're, what we're doing here is we're going and digesting every single moment of this 
this uh, this little little thing that they put out, this magic key, if you will. And yeah. uh, we're going to do a deep dive and try to understand how they got to where we're at, because it does very much feel like something that was grown out of a boardroom and mm-hmm. just what's going to make the shareholders happy. Um, not not really so much the the consumers, the people that are out there buying the, the magic keys, but what's going to what's going to bring in the money, but, you know, less money for on our end to, to spend. Right. 100 percent, because I really want to try to get to this in today's conversation. Could these keys have you like you said, were they sold to boost numbers as quickly as possible to sort of save ticket sales and get park revenue and something that looked familiar before they have to do their quarterly audits and go and speak to their shareholders. And now that they quickly sold some, maybe at a price that they didn't want to sell them at, they have what they need. They can put it on pause. They can cruise through the holidays, which they could sell tickets to with their, with their eyes closed. And when the holidays pass, could we see another wave of pricing because essentially what they did six months after they opened is they slid in whatever they wanted to do during 2020, right? Like the 2020 price is like, we, we'd look real bad if we raised the park with higher prices. Let's go in at where we were at. Let's go up six months later, but I'm really interested to see if this was done indeed in a boardroom, if this was a short-term plan to get back to quarterly earnings, what's next. So if you're on that adventure with us, Tony, you ready to jump in and look at this crazy timeline? Let's do it. Hey, what do you think if we're, we're before we look at this timeline? Mm-hmm. Let's let's uh let's take a guesstimate as to how long it took them to put this together because I feel like if you were to say a week, a couple of days, I would believe you. I would say, yeah, this definitely feels like something that they just threw at the wall and said, "Okay, it's good enough. Let's get it out there." In my What's timeline, in- I have a zone where I think that they spent about a month going, oof, what we're thinking about doing might not work. Let's pivot and readjust, come up with something. And I think that's where the idea of let's make a pass program that looks just like what it used to, other than the reservations. Let's keep the price point the same. Let's lock in X amount of people. And two months later, right when we go into holidays, let's Let's bring it down. I mean, when things land on the exact date, that to me says that somebody somewhere pulled out a calculator, ran the numbers and said, if we do that for 60 days, we'll probably get about right here. We'll be in a good spot. So excellent question, Tony. Let's go over to our Dexter timeline with all the little red strings like Charlie over on um, It's Always Sunny and, and break it down. So this is where it starts today on our timeline. I'm, I'm going back far, but it's it's important. On February 24th, Disney announced that they would do the Touch of Disney event where DCA would open up, not Disneyland, no attractions, basically a food fair that arguably they were really late to the game. Knott's had already done it. Universal had already done something like this. Many of the parks pivot over to a food festival. I always thought they never wanted to do this in Disneyland because they wanted to keep the prestige of Disneyland and the brand a cut above everyone else. And I felt like the reason why they did this um, to DCA was this was the moment like, when are we really going to reopen? We need to put something on the table and we need to make something happen. So they announced at the end of February that from March 18th to April 5th, Touch of Disney would be running. But there was a problem in here, is that on the 18th, I'm standing out in the Esplanade, ready to go in to DCA for Touch of Disney. But one day before that happened, they announced, by the way, April 30th, we're reopening the park. Now, That's a good thing, right? We all wanted Disneyland to get reopened. But part of what I wanted to talk about today and explore was how rushed was that reopening? Because they already had one event going and everybody says, well, no big deal. They need to get the park open. They need to get back to making money. And I totally agree with that. However, it did seem rushed when Disney, which is sort of the normally the slowest moving vessel in the water of theme parks in, in California and in the industry, really. I mean, they, they take their time, 
They overthink it. They analyze it. And the whole idea, just like with Apple, Apple's not the first one to do something to their laptops or their phones, but there's this idea amongst a lot of consumers that when Apple does it, they wait and they do it better. And Disney is sort of that same sort of brand in the theme park industry. So when they're beating knots, when they're beating a lot of their competition to get open by May, and once again, if we look at this from a boardroom, Tony, doesn't Friday, April 30th just say, at least we're hitting April? It really does. And th- yeah, the timing is is kind of suspect. Everything about that that launch, that that date, I don't know. It's It does scream like they had something going on with that. I can't put my finger on what exactly that was, but I'm definitely in line with what you're saying. Like, I agree that that had to have been something like that. Well, it, to me, it just says from a boardroom strategy, you know, not the people that are boots on the ground, but the people that crunch the numbers and importantly are liable and responsible for how the numbers get crunched. It almost seemed like it doesn't matter what it takes. I want this park open by April, Friday, April 30th. And, you know, really when they were given permission to reopen, if they would have opened any time in May, nobody would have faulted them. Like everybody wanted to get in, but also everybody understands what a big operation this is, how many employees it is. So April 30th would be the reopening. They would open up the reservations for the tickets on April 12th. Now, this is just, you know, we're getting like days in. Uh, into the park getting ready to reopen like seriously days into to it reopening and i'm sorry i have the dates wrong here touch of disney actually overlapped um with the reopening or i'm sorry with the ticket sales so when i said touch of disney ran till april 5th it actually ran further than that because i remember that i had tickets for touch of disney on the date that the tickets dropped and i had to figure out well what do i want to do here do i want to go to an event that i already paid for or do I want to buy tickets? Which is really weird because, as you know, Touch of Disney didn't run seven days a week. They could have easily pushed the ticket sales back or forward a day. And it was just very interesting how it's almost like they knew that this was all coming. And they just said to you know the, the governor, like, can we just slide back the announcement? Because we've already put one thing up for sale we just want to get one thing out of the door before we start the next thing. But I definitely remember that touch of Disney was sort of already made less special because immediately it was announced that the park was going to reopen. And I just want to say that's a good thing. We wanted Disneyland to get open as quickly as possible, but does it sound like typical Disney to be that fast to the gate where one thing's overlapping with the other. And the answer I think is no, but also once again, we find ourselves in a very, very weird point of time. I'm not saying what they did is wrong. I'm just trying to illustrate that everything was very rushed. It was run and gun and get everything done as fast as possible. And I think a lot of these numbers were, were forecasted in a boardroom and not really in like a strategy room of people that actually have to do these things. And to add on to that too, looking on the, site aspect of it the website both you and i spent a lot of time with the more than an hour big thunder goat right oh yeah and we saw how the juggernaut of the demand to get tickets to these events how how bad it was and continues to be honestly for these special events we still see it but that level of unpreparedness of like okay we see that you outsourced your server capabilities to to try to handle the load and you're still struggling. You're still, you know, you think Disney, oh, they, they could throw multi millions of dollars at servers, all that stuff. And they're going to struggle with this, with the, with this, you know, uh, they're, they're reopening the parks, they're doing all these things, and they're not going to spend that extra money to have a, a silky smooth experience on the, on the user end to, to order tickets. It's, it just seemed very rushed to me that, that whole aspect of it. Well, to your point, do you remember back when this rolled out? You had to get a reservation and then buy a ticket, which I had complained about that when I go to the movies, I say, this is the film I want to see. I want to see it at 730. I pick my seat and I have my ticket. I don't go, hmm, 
I would really like to go to the movies at 7.30 I, and I'm going to get a seat. I hope the movie that I want to see is available then. Like they had it backwards because obviously they didn't have their website and their software done yet. Like I don't think the ticket portal was perfected and they kind of did a little hodgepodge like, well, this will get us through the first 30 days. So now let's, let's move up to the opening of Disneyland, this ambitious, get it open by April 30th date. Tickets did not sell out for the first day by the end of the first day of ticket sales. Okay. So if you logged onto their website by like six o'clock, you could still get a ticket to the first day. Now I know what people are saying, but COVID restricted numbers, only California residents, that makes it even crazier because if they were getting, I don't know, 10, 20, 30% tops in on the opening day. When they didn't sell out 30% capacity or less in the first like 10 hours, the first, you know, 12 hours, whatever it ended up being, I knew right away that they had a problem with their ticket sales. And this is a limited capacity ticket sell that wasn't selling out. So when we look at the park reopens, it opens up with, Shorter hours, limited offerings, and very, very short staffed. I mean, they were really kind of, you know, it was a very different experience. And it wasn't a bad experience, but it was a different experience. So the park opens on the very end of April for two months. This is important. Low crowds, not a lot of people there, a low capacity. It was very, very easy to snag reservations And for this moment, it's probably one of the best times I ever got to visit the park because it was easy to get in, easy to get out. It wasn't overwhelmed. Now, granted, everything wasn't open. And I know that out-of-state people couldn't come in. But if you just ignore the out-of-state thing, Southern California or California in general, we have enough people interested in Disneyland to peg it at 30 and 40% because in a minute I'm getting ready to prove something that will really, really show that. So in this moment, the park is easier than ever to get into. Uh, Everything's not running. There's a shorter hours. I've already said all that, but it's a very easy park to get into. And during this window, the 430 window to the day after the 4th of July, everything that we heard, both Bob Chapek and Josh tomorrow and Kenny P. Rocks all say the three leaders, you know, we got the guy in charge of the company, the guy in charge of the parks, and the guy in charge of Disneyland. That trio of leadership, everything that they were saying about the annual pass program was making it sound like it was going to shift into a rewards program. Do you remember all that language that they were putting out? And remember when I went back and looked at that survey that they sent out to a lot of former pass holders, there was actually a clause in there for defining what a membership program was. And it was basically saying, the more you spend, the more you earn on extras, like extra experiences, extra merchandise, extra food offerings. That's the language that they were using in that 430 to 4th of July window. So that's all of June, all of July, or I'm sorry, that's all of May and all of June. That's the window that we're talking about where they're just getting a reopening. But when they're talking about an annual pass program, it's sounding a lot like a rewards program. And I recall specifically when they were using this verbiage and it was pretty frequent, they were definitely setting the table for, Hey, like there's going to be some changes. You guys might not like it, but there's going to be some serious changes And I think your analogy was basically like, we are going to be buying into a Costco membership, which I thought was spot on exactly based on how they were wording it. Right. That was the correct assumption that you are going to basically be paying for this membership and you get certain privileges, but your annual pass that is bye bye. It's gone. Yeah. You know, there's no such thing anymore. It's going to be a totally different beast. Now, what we got, obviously, actually, you know, pretty similar to the annual pass. But in that moment in time, everybody is dreading the worst. And I'm sure you were too, right, Mark? Yeah, I mean, it was 
it was a, a weird time to wonder what it was going to be like. But at the same time, we had this two month window where they're not trying to get in as many people as are getting in today. Okay. And the park wasn't selling out. And the key factor in this short window of time was that everybody had to buy a ticket. And a lot of people would go in and, and buy tickets. And the problem with the multi-day ticket is, is if you buy the five day, it's a good value, but you got to use five days inside of what uh, a two week window. And that's hard for a lot of local people or, you know, people that don't want to just live at the park for five days that, you know, want to kind of like spread it out over five weeks. So in this time, in this May and June time, we have a park that's not selling out and it's flowing easily because everybody's on a single ticket. Now, this is where I think everything changed, Tony. The day after the 4th of July, they announced that three-day ticket, $249, California residents only. That's really important. So we're still not even looking for out-of-state visitors. It was California residents only. You had to pay for all three days at once. So the 249 got you down to like 85 bucks a day. And now in the month of July and the month of August and the month of September, once the value customer returned, the park started to feel full again. So there was that two months of everybody paying the same price where the park ran at a very small capacity and there was lots of access. But then the 249 value ticket comes in and you see the park getting back to buzzing. It felt more familiar to 2019 than it ever had. And I think that was some sort of a test. That was some sort of like, let's do this and see what it looks like. Because I feel like it was in that window that the magic key was dreamt up and ready to get released and, and get told to everybody once again, almost one month later, seven, five, the value ticket goes on sale and they sell like crazy eight, three, the magic key is announced. And this is what I'm thinking. This is part of my theory today. And I could be wrong, but it's fun to theorize, especially when you look at a business that you love so much. Did they do two months on ticket sales only? saw that even with just local people, it was hard to sell out at a 30% capacity. And did they get nervous on going, if we do a rewards program and everybody's buying a ticket, how full will this park be? How mad will these customers be? And how well will this rewards program go over? And then once they put in the value ticket and they let that run for weeks, you know, cause they had to, this had to overlap with their announcement was the value ticket. Like let's put it in. And if all of a sudden we can hit certain metrics that decides for us, do we go to the left or do we go to the right over here? Do we go single tickets rewards program or over here? If we hit a certain metric, we go, let's get back an annual pass program as quickly as possible because that's the tipping point that Disneyland needs, which is a one day park DCA, a half a day park, three hotels. This is not Walt Disney world. Now that I've been there and you're there right now, I understand Disneyland is a whole different animal and it makes so much more sense to me how it is a California park, an Arizona park, an Oregon park, a Washington park. And then the rest of the country, they come sometimes, but it really is dependent on those States that I announced. Yeah. Uh, it's not really built for Tony Mendez of the world. Like, Coming in from Got, Chicago. Yeah, coming in from Chicago. Um, but to your point, I do feel like this was very much a boardroom choose your own adventure, right? Like they were literally like, okay, this is either going to go one way or, then, or another way. And we're going to have to figure out real quick on how we're going to, you know, roll this out or what the, the plan is going to be. Are we going to stick to, you know, this, this thing that we've been setting up that we've been hinting at Yeah, that seems to have been there's a pretty negative response. I mean, it seemed like people were reading between the lines for the first time and actually digesting it. And obviously you, you were a big help in that where you're, you know, doing your Kenny P rocks poetry and but, explaining you know, to people what was in there. I was reading it that way. My friend Peter over at ordinary adventures was reading it that way. I mean, there were, there were a lot of people that study this. I even remember kind of, 
I think I was, you know, Dusty Sage over at Mice Chat. Like, nobody understands the operations of the park better than him. And I feel like he was alluding to something like this was what was brewing. And, I mean, you know, that guy seems to be very connected uh, on both sides of the, the fence, if you will, both sides of the berm, if you will. And it just felt like that's where it was going. So now what I want to do is I want to take everybody to August, right? There's a three-day ticket that's buzzing. Park is starting to feel full for the first time. And it just stays that way until they announce the Magic Key is coming back, right? So they announce the Magic Key is going to come back and it's going to land on August 25th. And suddenly the park slows back down again. Because why am I going to buy a one-day, two-day, three-day, five-day ticket when I'm going to get it all back for one lump sum? So once again, we see the park quiet back down, which well played on Disney. Sell as many of these three-day tickets as you can. Make a lot of money because you know, it's like when you know when you announce you're going to have a Black Friday sale. You know you've just killed business for the two weeks leading up to your Black Friday sale. The only people that are going in Best Buy are people whose TV broke. But, you know, anybody who really wants a TV as an upgrade, as a lifestyle upgrade, they're going to wait till Black Friday. But the guy whose kids, you know, through the Wii controller at, at the uh, TV, he, he can't wait till Black Friday. So he's got to go in on, you know, Sad Monday and buy one. But essentially, you see it slow back down again because they're waiting for the magic key. Now our timeline can go a little bit faster. 825, magic key sell. And they don't sell out, which is no surprise. I never knew annual passes to sell out before. But at the end of August, they go on sale in 2019 prices. By October 1st, so, you know, once again, about a month later, the reservation system is fatigued, it is worn out, and the media, both the independent media on YouTube and over in the blogverse, but the local media, the ABCs, the CBSs, the NBCs, you know, people are starting to cover, hey, Disney sold people this $1,400 pass, and these people are having a really, really hard time to use it. And then we we go to October 25th, Disney announces at the end of the Halloween season and the beginning, just right at the, the, the you can reach and feel Christmas with your hand, that the dream key, the top key is being paused and they're raising prices. Two months, you could buy one of these things. Two months, the park is building and building. It gets to a breaking point, and all of a sudden, they make a quick switcheroo. This thing is no longer available, and by the way, tickets are going up because there's now six tiers, and you could end up spending well over 200 and something dollars if you want to do both parks one day. If you want to go to one park one day, you're looking at 165 which is $65 more than the first tier which is not too far away from what one day was on the three-day value ticket. So a pretty significant price point. The reason why I wanted to give that timeline is I wanted to show everybody how every month something different is happening. And some of these things kind of contradict the thing before it. But also, if you're a student of business, you can see where we're going to try this for two months, then we're going to pivot, we're going to try this. Like these dates all really well line up that it was somewhat scripted that this runs for 60 days. Then we try this. If this goes this way, then we go that way. And I mean, I understand. I don't want this to sound like complaining. I want this to sound like studying a business model because the leadership was coming out of something that nobody knows how to recover from. How do you take a place that brings thousands of strangers together every single day post a pandemic that none of us have known in our lifetime. And for everybody that goes, well, Bricky, the reason why it's selling out is because there's a pandemic going on and there's social, social distancing. And to them, I say, you haven't been to Disneyland because there's not a pandemic at Disneyland right now. There is no social distancing at Disneyland. It is every ride is full. Every shop is full. Every eatery is full and every street is full. For people that complain when you're like, oh, you know, California people whining because they can't get in the park. There's a pandemic going on. It may be happening where you're living, but it is not happening in Orange County. And it is 
not happening inside of Disneyland. It is pack them to assholes and elbows in there right now. Yeah, it's um, it's it's a bizarre situation just because of obviously they they had a lot of people that were really trying to to plan everything out to to figure out what would be the best plan to come back from you know such a such a awful awful year yeah how do you how do you rectify this how do we make money again how do we get people in the parks so i don't want to discount that obviously this isn't one person's decision i know we like to have no the, the boogeyman you know but in this particular instance i'm sure there were lots and lots of, of people bringing their heads together and how do we you know uh alleviate some of the financial stress that we've been seeing and this is this is what they came up with now i i did i will say i did purchase a magic key so i am now first time disneyland annual pass holder magic key holder so do, um, do you still have a annual pass for walt disney world yes i do okay. yeah so i have both now which, wow. which is amazing wow. which humble brag but to be fair, I did just buy my Disney World annual pass right before the pandemic started, yes, and that was did. pretty bad. But anyways, that's neither here nor there. But basically, yes, uh, Magic Key dropped. I got to see all the excitement. Everybody was happy. It was like it didn't even matter that it was, you know, any differences were neg- negligible, right? They wasn't that big a deal. They were just happy to have some sort of an annual pass back. Yeah. Now, I felt that FOMO. I was like, oh, man, you know. Is it is it worth it for me to to spend that kind of money on getting a magic uh, magic key? Yeah, I I landed on the middle one, whatever that one's called. But by the way, whoever named these magic keys so confusing. Ah, oh, come on, just just this should just kept an annual pass. Like really, all it does is confuse things. But anyways, I I bought the middle key, so now I have a key. But boy, oh boy, am I happy that I bought it when I did because once I saw that they shot those prices up. I was like, man, like how bad does that suck? Like for people that missed out or were like, you know what? I'm going to hold off. It'll still be there. Right. It'll... And then they jack up the prices and you're like, ah, oh. like I just, I could see the frustration that I'm sure a lot of people have when anytime that sort of thing happens, but for that quick, a turnaround for yeah. that, for that to happen, yeah. that's where it really hurts. Right. Mark, that's where it's like, you, you do feel kind of burned. You feel left out on that. Well, let's, let's look at, some of the factors that I believe are attributing to the park being so overwhelmed in such a quick amount of time. Cause we literally are six months into the reopening. And I mean, it is really packed down there. And, you know, obviously when they were having a hard time selling less tickets to everybody, the, the clear thing here is the value customer, right? The value customer is the tipping point to keeping this particular park full. But, if I look back in my decade of being a fan and an AP at the park, I've hardly ever known for the park to sell out. Okay. Like I know that it sold out a couple of times on those 24 hour parties, which in the beginning were really special and amazing and got kind of dangerous and wild towards the last couple of years. But I hardly ever knew Disneyland to sell out. It's been selling out nearly every single weekend and people will tell me oh no that's just for the pass holders i went to go buy tickets for my in-laws that are coming into town and if they're watching this i just ruined the surprise but nobody's watching this but i i bought them tickets and when i went to buy them tickets for when they're coming in here for thanksgiving you could not buy tickets for the next two weeks okay they were not selling tickets reservations. I mean, it was locked up and I know that Disney will go in and refresh and add more reservations in and things get moved around. But for the most part, the park was kind of at like a quote unquote sold out or tipping point of selling out nearly, you know, most days out of the week. So the park doesn't have, as I can read much of a limited capacity. I mean, if it is a limited capacity, they're like at 80%, 90%, but it's really, really close to just being like, you couldn't put more people in here. You know, when you're looking at Space Mountain wait times that are hitting an hour and a half, two hours, you know, you're looking at the Haunted Mansion holiday, which is two and a half hours. Uh, most smaller rides are somewhere in the ballpark of 45 minutes. I mean, it's, it's pretty packed in there, which got me to think, okay, what's different here? other than maybe 10% or 15% of the people are missing. Why is there so much demand? Like why is the park quote unquote sold out 
if you understand what my definition of sold out is, because people get really literal on everything that you say on YouTube. I thought that this was happening, Tony. Back in the day, you would buy your pass and you go, zippity doo da. I can go to the park any day that I want to. And because you could go any day that you want to, some people, sure, went six days a week. Some people went, you know, once a week. They got their rhythm. I go every Tuesday, I go every Thursday. But a lot of people would just go when it worked out for them. And you know how fast life gets, especially when people have kids and jobs and, and you know, all kinds of different activities. You say, you know what, we're going to buy passes for the family and we're going to go once a month. And then all of a sudden, two months go by and you go, man, we haven't been to Disneyland for a while. We should put a date in the calendar and go. And I feel like a lot of people were just kind of more fluid with their decision on going to the park. But when somebody tells you, you bought this thing for $1,400, and by the way, you can only go six times. People go to a calendar and go, okay, family meeting, Friday the 15th. Everybody good? Everybody's good. Put it in there. Okay, Sunday the 27th. Everybody good? Everybody good? Put it in there. And what you started to see people do is go, oh, man, I can only go six times. I'm going to put all six times in the calendar. And when I go my first time, another one opens up. I'm going to add in my sixth time. So I think that what happened was, is the reservation system, which I foolishly thought people are going to end up loving the reservation system because they're going to keep the park at a smaller capacity with the mindset. Because the park was buzzing so well before, Tony, I thought the idea was keep the park for the future of Disneyland at a 60% capacity because at 60%, People can ride more, people can spend more, and people can have a better time. And therefore, when you're happier, you're spending more, right? You're like, let's get t-shirts, let's eat, let's get treats. It's so locked up right now that it's hard to even spend money there. So you have more people, but I would wonder what your spend per guest is. It has to go down when everything locks up willy and you can't really get in there. So what I'm thinking is, Tony, and I'd love to hear what you think is, If you can just kind of come and go, you just kind of come and go. But when somebody tells you, you can only go two times, four times, six times, you're going to lock that in. And I think that's why the park has been quote unquote selling out because people feel like, well, if I don't go today, one, I'm going to get penalized, but two, when can I get back in there? And when the YouTube drum, the blog drum, the local media drum says it's sold out, it's sold out, it's sold out. Even if you have a fever or you don't feel well or you kind of feel tired because you had, you know, kids had soccer the night before, hell or high water, you're going in there because you don't want to get penalized. And when will we get back in? And I really feel like the reservation system, in a way, has kind of backfired because it's forcing people to go more often. Yeah. I mean, it, the reservation system, for whatever its good intentions may have been, um, have basically just created this sense of urgency for everything right where you're like oh man i have x amount of days that i have to get in on the calendar i have to get it locked down yep. because if i don't what's going to happen is i'm going to get iced out and i'm not going to be able to go with my friends or my family i mean we're seeing this now where within our club i'm flying out next next week for for marius nights for designer con i will be out there and I'm saying, hey, who's going to be out there? And everybody is literally scrambling to look at their reservations and go, oh, man, I would love to meet you out there. But I already have it booked for these days because I'm going to be there with my family. Right. Or I, I've already got the week before or after. So it's it's created this this urgency, this like this panic to, to try to get things booked, to try to to get things, you know, all worked out and planned out and everything, which is good for, you know, who. This is good for Disney because then they go, aha, we now have you locked in. You are coming to the parks on this date and we know you're going to spend money. Yeah. We know you're going to buy stuff. We know you're going to buy food. When you were annual pass holder, you go willy nilly. You didn't have to spend a buck. You were there. You can go down Main Street. You can go on rides and you're in and out of there. It's true. But when you are hardwired in, when you're on the reservation system, they've got you and you are. It's, it's all mapped out. And you're seeing people, reservation people, local people, you're seeing them go longer hours, making a day out of it because like, hey, man, I can't get back in for three more weeks. And we're all junkies because we love this place so much. So it's like you're not seeing the casual like, I'm going to show up at nine o'clock, ride two things, 
get out by 1130, you know, whether that's AM or PM, that's up to you. So as I've thought, it took kind of 40 minutes to establish the timeline and to, to, to talk about how the reservation system is really forcing people to go in more. But now I want to get into like what the magic key mistakes are because I feel like everything's been a learning process. Everything for Disney has been a bit rush, which makes sense because of coming out of what we came out of. But right out of the gate, my business spidey senses would say this. If it's constantly selling out, if you don't have enough inventory in business, that means your price is too low. Okay. So I feel like that top tier, the dream that's now pause, that's the level it's paused. You can still get lower levels, I believe. But the dream was obviously priced back in 2019 prices. People have more, some people have more money coming out of the pandemic because they weren't able to spend as much money. But people also have this, like, I got to get back to living my life. And so I think some people are a little bit faster and looser with money coming out of the, uh, the, the pandemic. The $1,400 was obviously way too low, like way too low. If it could only hold 60 days of sales and completely crush the park to me, that says it should have been more or question. Was it the perfect price? Because they sold a ton of them. They immediately got the park in a matter of 60 days. What's time time's done. The park's back to feeling like 2019. We made a time machine called the dream key and we put everybody in it. And the next thing you know, we were right back to where we were. And we get to go into a boardroom and say, guess what, everybody? The parks, which is the backbone of the Disney Corporation. The parks make insane money seven days a week, 12 months a year, 365. Okay? The movies, eh, sometimes they make some money. Sometimes they don't. They cost a lot of money. They go slow. They go fast. The movies are just what the movies are. But the park has been the earning backbone, that in ESPN, has been the earning backbone of the ABC Disney Corporation for quite some time. Now, Disney Plus comes along, and that seems like real steady revenue. But, you know, millions of people at $7 versus, you know, thousands of people at $1,400 and spending food. These are these backbone earning systems that they have. So magically, they were able to speed up time and get there. Also, I think a magic key mistake that was made, aside from the price being too low or not having enough inventory, is that the reservation system is not fluid enough. It's the reservation system's fault that the park is so maxed out and that these things had to, quote unquote, pause or sell out. And by not being fluid enough, they obviously have different buckets, right? There's a bucket for single day ticket buyers. There's a bucket for hotel guests. There's a bucket for four different tiers of passes. And those buckets seem to be very fired walled off and they don't seem to flow back and forth a lot. And part of the frustration is, is people going, I'm paying $1,400. I can't get into the park today. You're paying 150, 25, 109, 160, and you can get in. Now, everybody knows the single ticket buyer is the second most profitable person at the park. Number one being the hotel guest. You book a hotel you should be guaranteed to be able to buy a key. Like it should never be sold out to a hotel guest. That's just business 101. But the next tier is the single ticket or multi-ticket value guy. And then you get into your passes. But the problem is, is there's not enough fluidity between those different buckets. So it seems like they need to go once again. And we've seen them work on the software of the website when it used to be get a reservation, then buy a ticket. Now that's just collapsed into one process the reservation system is not fluid enough. And so the way that it is now, it forces people to do the parks in a way they've never done it before. Um, I've never known the park to sell out. I've well, few, very few times around, you know, crazy circumstances, new years, you know, a 24 hour party, but not on every weekend in October. Uh, but I've also never known a top tier, of a pass to sell out before. So when I'm seeing the mistakes, I'm seeing the inventory is wrong. 
the pricing is wrong, and the website, the software is wrong, the way these things connect. Like, imagine this. If around 2 o'clock every day, they realize, okay, we had the X amount of hotel guests booked today. This is where we're at. There's some free tickets. We had this amount of walk-up tickets. Here's some free tickets. That all goes into a pool, and then they can just kind of figure out Dream Key gets 60% of those. Next key down gets, you know, 25%. This key gets 15. This key gets 5%. Like if that was always talking and flowing with each other, then you could see people go, well, I know Tony's in town from Chicago. And I know at two o'clock is when they do the day standby for APs or key holders. I'll try at two o'clock and see my luck when they open up those numbers. You know what I mean? Or I know that every night at midnight when the the cancellations before go in, we can grab more. It just, it doesn't work that way. And I think that's where a lot of frustration gets in is when people pay for something and they can't use it. And when they see other people paying a little bit more and using it, that's when there becomes like a class system that just angers people up. And even what you're laying out right now, you know what it sounds like to me? It kind of sounds like this thing. I know it's called uh, gambling yeah. where you, you're really, you're hoping you can make something happen, but uh, you're probably not going to make it happen. Now, obviously we are paying for a magic key. I would hope that there would be some sort of privileges, some, sure. you know, something a little extra for, for the little guy that's spending the money to have, to have this pass. But it's still a scramble. It's still a mad dash to figure out, you know, what the, what the deal is, if you're going to be able to make these things happen. And the annual pass had none of that. It was stress-free. You knew you were getting in when you were getting in, you would, you might have to glance at the calendar every once in a while, but that, that extra added stress was not there. And now let me ask you something. Yeah. Do you think this reservation system how long until that gets sunset? Reservation system never goes away. It's here to stay? Never goes away. If you owned a business and you could know every single day how many customers you're going to have, that is a financial crystal ball that nobody would ever give away. I, I would personally, if you could say, you own Disney. I own Disney right now. I could have two things. I could either have the crystal ball that is the reservation system, knowing how many people come in, or I could have Madame Leota. I'm drilling three holes in her head, turning into a bowling ball, and it's going to be sick when you see me at the lanes. I'm like, Leota, you're out of here. I need to know what the reservations are. I know you're historic. I know that you know, you're know you somebody's mom of a mom, but I'm putting holes in your head, and I'm throwing you and hoping for a strike because the reservation system never goes away. 100% never goes away. So when I look at the resolution of how do they fix the magic key program, they need to figure out inventory and pricing, which I think is why they paused it. I really think that the initial 2019 rollout was to make that time machine to financially get to where they need to go. The price point needs to go up. If they can't make more reservations happen, the software needs to work more fluid. Like I just broke down. They also need to figure out, like, maybe give people more reservations, right? Like, if you give people more reservations, would it help where people can easily, like, spread out more or more dates? Or here's another thought. Um, Because if you had more reservations, you'd maybe feel less panicked. Well, I can go, like, 12 times. So, you know, maybe I'll grab some dates. Or the opposite of that maybe go less reservations because if you only had two reservations at a time, which everybody now hates me for saying that you couldn't camp out on the dates. And that's what's happening with six or four or two or three, whatever it is, people are camping out on the dates. They're going in and going, I want this weekend in December. I want this weekend in December. I want this weekend in December, you know, maybe keeping it less dates would be better. I don't know. I don't have, the engineering degree that somebody has to, to figure out all of this, but I do know the current system's not working and they need to figure out what that proper balance is. And they also need to make an easier cancellation process. Like people are literally, I've heard so many stories of people that literally go down there, walk through the the turnstile 
and walk back out just because they don't want to get penalized. That's crazy. That is rough. Because that's taking hey, somebody else's spot. It is. It really is. But it's okay. They'll, they'll send out some new magnets. It's fine. <laughs> a magnet makes everything what go away. can't a magnet make go away? So when I look at the, the, the mistakes, Tony, I see it as the reservation system isn't completely evolved. The price point seems off. Or maybe it's exactly what they wanted. Because... When you take away that top tier right before the busiest time of the year, you know what you're saying to people is, well, the dream key has gone. So if you want to go, you can pick a lower pass, which won't probably get you into the days you want to go. Or you can buy our convenient new six tier, most expensive ever ticket. That is not an accident that is well-crafted and well-planned. Okay. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to give these idiots the 2019 pricing for 60 days. But before we go into that holiday season, we're going to lock that down because now we have 2019 revenue just fell back in our lap. And now we're going to start playing the game differently for the next two months. And then in January or February, whenever they already have this probably on a whiteboard somewhere up in Burbank or maybe now in Orlando because everything's going out east. Um, in January, February, we'll hit everybody with what that pricing should have been. The $1,800 Dream Key. And $400 would probably be enough to make people go, oh, I don't know. 1800 or 1200 I mean, they essentially made that pricing to push people into the dream. Back in the day, being a top-tier pass holder, most people were always one below. They're always at that one below. It's like, well, I don't really need to go during Christmas. I don't need this or that. But this was crafted to shoot you right to the top. And that, to me, says quick recovery, and then we'll slowly figure it out. I mean, there's probably a lot of people right now today that wouldn't rebuy it because they don't feel like it was a value. But... What's that next price point going to be? Because what we'll get into next is some people will be paying like, for example, the $1,800, but the $1,400 crowd knows that when that uh, August anniversary comes around, get ready for that credit card to get zapped or for that monthly payment to go up. Yeah, that's uh, the the amount of money that was kind of negligible of like the difference, right? It it wasn't too, too harsh, but I get exactly what you're saying, which is that it, it's made in such a way that it's going to be like, oh, yeah, you know, what's another 100 bucks or 200 bucks and to get you into that next bracket? Me personally, I, I looked at it and I was like, you know, as much as I want the baller pass, and as much as I my heart desires it and thinks it needs it, I'm like, I'm fine going with the middle pass because obviously I, I live out of state. Yeah. It's, you know, it's an entirely different ball game for me. Yeah. But yeah, obviously, if you live in the state of California, it, it makes sense to get that pass because it's 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 made for you. Right. Just parking but alone adds up now at thirty dollars to park your car. I was literally going to say, like, isn't it bizarre how much of a factor parking has played into it for people that live in the state of California? I mean, like, and it's it's not something to squawk at either. Like, no. it's a big difference. Um, Go five times. And you've already bought a single day ticket, right? I mean, that's what the parking factor is. So when I look at these suspicious timelines, you halt the magic keys right before the holidays. At that exact same time that you halt the magic keys, the price goes up, which says to me, we've done enough of 2019 prices. And in fact, when the prices go up six months, the reopening, it's like, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do 2019 prices and then six months in, we're going to drop 2020 prices and then three or four months later or six months later, we'll go to our 21 or 22. Somehow in here, there's going to be another rapid price increase so they can get on the rhythm of where they already knew they wanted to be for 22 because you know somewhere they have it mapped out. This is what it costs in 22. This is what it costs in 23. You know they're able to show people, here's a five-year projection of where theme park revenue is going to be if we keep going up this much. And they're well within their rights. The park's packed. People don't seem to have a tipping point when it comes to what they'll pay for Disney. But when the Magic Key top tier, this is my last suspicious timeline, is paused two months to the release. 
I'm going to give you all these one more time. Sorry to be repetitive, but let's just look at it this way, that this was a boardroom decision, well scripted out before any real world, you know, metrics came into it. You halt the keys before the magic, before the busiest time of year. You halt the keys, raise single day prices. Prices go up six months to the opening of the park. Magic keys, top level pause, two months to the date after they were released. This to me says, this is what we need to do to get our finances where we need to. We'll get to this point. We'll pause. We'll go through the holidays. We'll raise prices up. We'll resume. And we're going to keep getting to that revenue that we need to get to faster and faster. We can go into our boardrooms and say, we're up 5%. Park's been open for six months and we're up 15% here. Like this is all well-designed, a well-planned out play. Like a lot of football coaches do this. They will show up to a game and have their first 10, 20 plays scripted out. No matter what the other team's doing, they already know their next play. And the reason why some football coaches do this, Tony, is because instead of worrying about what they're going to do next, they just watch the other team. Because they know their first 20 plays, they get to study your first 20 plays and understand where you're putting your guys, where you're heavy, where you're weak, what your strategy is, and then they start reacting to you. I say this was that. This was a well-scripted out six-month play. And now what comes after the holidays? Get ready. Yeah, as much as we like to to blame the Disney Illuminati or the Mad Titan Chapek, like this is this isn't none of that. This is clearly like you're saying, it's, it's all mapped out. There's it's a business. roadmap that's out there. Yeah. It's it's you know, it is what it is. This was set in motion a while ago, but I think this just it's it's bizarre going through this this timeline because I forget a lot of it. Yes. And and people do forget a lot of it. That's why you got to bring it all up in one conversation. Yeah, so you're not crazy, Mark. You are you 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 brought up some very good points, and I think honestly, I I was kind of sitting here and learning uh, while we were having this conversation. But no, I agree. I think this was all nothing is set in stone, obviously, but this was definitely planned and coordinated, and we're seeing it executed right now. Whether you like it or you don't, it is what it is. It's business. Um, it's business. And I love studying business and that's been a passion of mine is to look at business models and how they work and, you know, why Apple never puts anything on sale, why Tesla is so successful. I mean, there's just, there's these, these brands that just really over and over again seem to nail um, the efficiency of their relationship with their customer and always making it more and more profitable for them. All right. Here's what I want to do before we get into our Club 1313 bonus content for members that support this content. I have some theories that I just want to drop and discuss with you. And we run a little bit over. That's fine. This is kind of a big one. Like I said, I wanted to kind of get this out before we get into the holidays. It's kind of a quiet time and a good time to have this conversation. These are some theories that I sort of crafted when I was putting together this timeline. Tony, what do you think? Were the Original keys sold to be a quick boost of the numbers to get everything where it needed to be. Now that you've seen the timeline, now that we've broke it down. Yes, hundred percent. I think so. I, I think so uh, too. It, it's just, it's all there, especially that now that we roadmapped it the way that we did. Yep. hundred percent. Absolutely. And I think also another one of my theories is this, this was a way to quickly recover soft ticket sales and get park revenue exactly where it needs to be. Like that first two months that I broke down where they opened faster than anybody thought and it wasn't selling. It's like when that value ticket comes in, you see how Disneyland really needs the value customer to get to that financial tipping point. And also to think about this, they had so much publicity when they announced the sunsetting of the annual pass program. Yep. And then they got even more publicity once they announced this new program, Magic Keep. 100%. 100%. So that's a lot to think about. My other theory is now that they have this crowd and they have this revenue, they're able to pause and go into the holidays right where they need to be. They're going into the busiest time of the year with all the customers they need. And whenever they can get people to go, well, if you really want to go, you can go buy one of the new six-tier tickets. They have just played this masterfully to make 
this next three months wildly, wildly profitable because they have set up the first six months. Those scripted out plays have gotten them into this moment. And so what I think happens next is they're going to start raising the prices to get that proper balance, right? Like we have too many people, we have too many passes, we have a park that's too full. How do we bring it back down? And I feel like that's going to be the next wave of where we get because what they need is to have a better balance of revenue to number of guests. And this was all like a dash play to get them to 2019 as quickly as possible. I'll be interested to see what comes next. For sure. It's... It's wild how coordinated this seems once we've actually talked about it. Yeah. But yeah. I'm on, I'm on, I'm on there with you. And obviously in the beginning, they thought that the reward program would work, but it didn't. So they had to pivot over to something that felt like it would it used to. And essentially they kind of did give customers for a while what they knew, but I feel like a bait and switch might be coming where the price points are going to change. Because now if you have the lower pass and you're getting hit with $30 for parking, that suddenly, that kind of changes things for some people. You know I mean? Think about it. Some people are paying, I don't, I don't know what the monthly prices are, but let's say you're paying 75 to, um, you know, $110 a month. When you look at $30 to go, like, man, just to go, we're kind of giving them, you know, 30% or, or, you know, 40% of our annual or our monthly price. So it's definitely interesting that this is where the magic key, I believe was invented to solve a temporary problem. And now they will come up with that next wave. That is a more long-term solution, which is going to be, how do we get pricing reservation and inventory better dialed in? But the good news for everybody that needs numbers to keep their jobs, they got the numbers, baby. Keys sold well. They got lots of press. Parks back to full. They're going to have a very successful holiday season. And then in January, February, when they start readjusting everything, it's all set up to uh, to, to go in the right direction for them. So I thought it would maybe not be fun. But interesting to break all this down. And this is, you know, something I really want to break down, Tony. They rushed every way they could to get the park back to normal. And that's not a bad thing. That's a survival tactic. That's a business thing. I don't think any of these things are evil conspiracies. I just think when you don't know what happens next and you're just living to each one of these dates in the timeline, you're like, oh, now this is happening. Touch of Disney. Oh, now the park's reopening. Oh, now there's a value ticket. Oh, a pass is coming. Now the park's crazy. When you stop and look back at it, you go, wait a minute. (laughs) I was following a carrot on a stick the whole time. (laughs) And somebody else knew that this was going to be the way they would all wrap out. I'm not trying to be a conspiracy theorist here. I'm just trying to say, well played, Disney. Like very well played to get your money right back to where you needed to be for what is the earnings backbone of the corporation. Calling it right now, Mark. Magic Key Plus. Coming to you soon. (laughs) Just throw that plus right in there. Well, let's get into some YouTube Plus for our Club 1313 members that make this video possible. Hey, I was so floored to see how well last week's episode did. I hope this episode stands up and keeps you interested and gets you thinking about all this stuff. Um, by all means, leave your comments below. Last week, so many people had so many good comments about, you know, um, how did people turn on Chapik when he was never really on in the first place, when people didn't like him? People wanted to know about, are Josh DeMauro's hands dirty and all this? Some people even going as far as to say, hey, Eisner wasn't as bad as what everybody predicted during his time. A lot of things that it sort of are the, 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 the tent poles of the company were invented. Like it was a really, really awesome dialogue in the comments. And I completely appreciate it. Would love to see that return this week. If anybody makes it this far to the end of the video, please leave a comment below. We'll be dropping these podcasts every Wednesday. Tony is my through line. He's always my co-host, but don't worry. I'll have lots of my YouTube friends and Disney art friends, uh, stopping by to have various conversations, just getting the podcast back feels so good. Tony, 
Thank you for another conversation. Are you ready to hop into the bonus content exclusively available for our members over at club1313.com? This is what I've been waiting for. Let's do it. You ready to talk some Book of Boba Fett? Oh, yeah. All right. Let's get into that bonus content right now. <laughs> 